All right, today we're going to be working on work design and measurement, chapter seven. Job design involves answering questions like what what will be done in a job who's going to perform the job how the job's going to be done and where the job's going to be done so if you think about it in a the aspect of being a student and working on a team for a project um, if you were to do a job design for that to specify whatever the contents or, or methods of the jobs are first thing you're, you're going to try to think about is what's what what's going to be done to complete the project so your your instructor is going to give you an assignment and you have to figure out exactly what needs to be done and then on top of that you need to find out you know he'll, he'll, he'll if it's a group project you'll receive you know group members so you need to start divvying out the different tasks to complete the project and then after that you you decide like how it's going to be done like if depending on what type of class it is, class it is you you might have to do some surveys um you might have to do some type of data analysis and then after you come up with all of your findings you need to find out you know if it has to be presented then who's going to do the presentation um and if everybody's going to do the presentation on the team how long is everybody going to be talking and then where the, the where part is where where's the team going to meet at are they going to meet on campus off off campus so when you start to think about job design as a student those are some of the the questions that will be asked if you're doing a job design you know for a team project uh, the main objectives of creating a job design is to answer questions about you know the productivity the safety of people, the people involved, and the quality of, of the work life. There are two schools of thoughts for job design. You have the efficiency approach. Um, it's called the efficiency approach because it emphasizes log uh, logical approach to job design. And then you have the, the behavioral approach. And this emphasizes satis satisfaction of needs and wants of of the employees and the people that are involved with the job design. Specialization is one of the factors used to design, uh, to do a job design uh, for a work system. People who carry out jobs usually specialize in something as part of, you know, getting that complete job done. So they, they'll know more about the activities of, of a certain part that goes into a job. And, and specialization is, is a totally different way. It's, it's different than the, the efficiency and the behavioral approaches of job design. Um, an example of this would be, you know, the instructors and teachers and, and faculty members at you know the college that you attend um, that everybody has some type of specialization that they have for example for me since I, I receive my my master's degree uh, uh, in business administration I'm more specialized for business related um, discussions or, or classes and on top of the MBA, even if you go down another step, the portion of MBA that classes, most classes that I took were human resources related. I did take accounting, I did take finance classes, I did take operation management classes, but my MBA was more geared towards HR. Now, also at the college you have, you know, the nursing program where even that's broken down to you know, registered nurse, uh, practitioners, uh, physical therapy. So it's all broken down based off of a specialized 
role that you know each individual is going to play into you know teaching students here at the college another example of being specialized would be like auto mechanics the the field of auto mechanics is broad where you have people that specialize in repairing and building engines repairing and building transmissions working on the electrical components of the car and just doing you know basic repair on a vehicle so even in auto mechanics you have specialized specialized jobs now special the the specialization has a lot of advantages available whether it's on the management side or for the employees on the management side when you have someone that specialized the first thing you can simplify the training so people that need training in a specific area can be trained together instead of having you know one person trained on this one person trained on that if everybody specializes in a certain group you're gonna have that whole group perform the same training so it makes training a lot easier uh, you have higher productivity because people are specialized in a particular job or a particular task so they don't have to worry about you know if they're putting together a vehicle if they're specialized in just you know bolting down the 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 engine they don't have to worry about the accounting behind you know how the the engine was purchased or or the financing or or marketing the the, the, the vehicle they're just paying attention to that part of the vehicle you know that they're specialized in um, and then also you have lower wage costs because you can pay people a certain amount you don't have to pay them based off of you know having all of these other skills if they're specialized in one thing that's who they that's how they're gonna pay on the employee side you don't really need too much of education you don't need an advanced degree um, or you may not need a advanced degree possibly you do if you're a doctor you need an advanced degree but you know if you're specialized in something you don't need extra you know extra degrees or or anything like that uh, minimum responsibility you have your job to do and that's it you know you don't have to worry about anything else you just get your part of the task done and you know let let the other people who specialize in other things get their job done little mental effort needed employees can come they they can work they can come to work start doing their work they know what they got to do they do their work and they leave some disadvantages on the management side include it, it, it it's difficult to motivate quality if person if a person's doing the same job over and over again they may become less motivated to to do a good job because it's just like a mundane task to them it's nothing new they just come in and do the same thing so it may decrease the motivation of the employee and then that goes up goes along with worker dissatisfaction um, which results in you know people being absent having a higher turnover rate and poor attention to quality so you don't want your quality to suffer uh, because you know your your workers aren't being stimulated uh, because they're they're just you know paying attention to that one thing that they're specializing in for employees again you have mundane work there's no creativity involved it's just pretty much I know I gotta go to work you know screw some some things into the engine and that's all I gotta do you know it's just the same job day in day out limited opportunities for advancement um, if you're specialized in, in a small area, um, that makes it a little difficult to, to be advanced or get an advancement. Little control over work. Management retains most of the control when it comes to specializations or specialized work. Um, so just know that. Some ways to overcome some of the disadvantages that having a specialization um, you know organizations have to come up with 
different ways to 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 stimulate you know their employees and their workers so there's three different ways you have job enlargement job rotation and job enrichment job enlargement pretty much it gives the the worker a larger portion of the total task by horizontal loading so more work at the same skill level so you're getting more and more work to to hopefully keep you engaged in the work job rotation um, that's when uh, people learn different aspects of a company or, or of a job so an example of that for me would be when I when I started work several years ago at the company that I'm employed at now I was able to learn different function I work in IT so I was able to work in like three or four different functions of IT. I worked on the help desk, I did desktop support, I did research and development, and I did something else. But there were I was able to rotate like every two to three months to to get a better understanding and a, a better appreciation of you know the IT field and you know, I, I was able to, you know, once once I got a got comfortable with one one area, I was able to move to another area and learn and get comfortable. So it wasn't like it was a mundane thing. I was able to, you know, move around and rotate the different jobs. Uh, job enrichment is another strategy that's used. Um, it increases responsibility for planning and coordination so by vertical loading so this means that you have a higher level of skill um, and you you'll help the employee advance throughout the organization so you have a higher skill level the employee advances around and gets to you know move around So while designing work, the organization must come, just they must keep in mind different ways to motivate their employees. Motivation contributes to the quality and productivity of an employee's work life. So it's a good it's good to recognize an employee for doing a good job. So if an employee does something, you know, goes above and beyond what's expected of them. It's always good to recognize that employee and, and employees like that recognition because it makes them feel like, you know, they're doing something to contribute to something bigger than, you know, than themselves. Um, so things like employee of the month, um, employee of the year, you know, or just, you know, telling the, the employee that, you know, they appreciate you know the efforts that they're putting into the work you know that that goes a long way for employees and, and motivating the employees uh, the next factor is teams um, which if you know if you break that down as far as like acronyms uh, T-E-A-M um, you can break it down to together everyone achieves more so I know it's a little cheesy but it is what it is. Uh, some of the benefits of being on a team is higher quality. So better, better ideas, um, coming up with better practices to perform jobs, which leads to, you know, higher quality, higher productivity, and some, most of the time, greater workers, worker satisfaction. So the, a different type of team is a self-directed team. Um, it's a, groups are empowered to make certain changes in their work processes so this doesn't mean that if you're in a self-directed team it doesn't mean that you have absolute power it just means that the organization has give empowers you to make certain changes to systems that that they work on that the workers work on so this should also lead to better quality and productivity and also greater worker satisfaction
So ergonomics is a scientific discipline used to gain an understanding of human interaction with the elements of a system. So things like whether a worker, you know, is standing or you know trying to produce, you know, having having them increase their production. So you look at things like, you know, if they're sitting, you know, what's their posture like? If they're sitting at a desk and looking at a computer, is that desk at eye level? You know, how's the mouse position? How's the keyboard position? Is that person sitting upright? Are they slouched? Is the chair comfortable? So things like that where companies and organizations look at ways to make sure that you know the the company or the employee is you know they're they're comfortable when they're working and that they're not fatigued and that they're not you know sore because you know if you use a mouse for so long and if you don't have the right padding you know that can cause problems like back problems and wrist problems with your wrists and problems with your hands so organizations have started to you know, look into the ergonomics and make sure that, you know, their employees are, are, you know, the, the work, the workplace is more conducive to a better, you know, for the employee. People work for many reasons. Um, they could be working to, you know, for some type of status. Uh, physical or mental stimulation um, just to be able to, to socialize um, but they have many different reasons as to why they work so the quality of work life affects not only a work uh, employees overall sense of well-being um, but it also affects the the productivity that they have at their job some important aspects of a worker's quality of work life include how a worker gets along with their co-worker so um, for some of the people that that work to to socialize you know to to have a you know a social part of their life if they don't like the people that they work with it's going to be very difficult for them to continue to work. Quality of management. If you have poor leadership, um, this discourages the, the workers and the employees. And it, you know, they may, the, the employees may not have too much respect for the manager or the supervisor or any type of management that, you know, that's over them. Um, may lose a lot of respect and that that'll lower the morale of the, the employee uh, different types of working conditions so you know if you if you're working in a place that's always cold you know you might not be thinking about you know quality of a product you're probably thinking about trying to stay warm and on the other other side if you're working in a place that's hot you might you know be sluggish throughout the day so, you know, different types of working conditions could adversely affect the quality of a product or an item. And it also could, you know, it just lower the, 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 the positive vibes that an employee might have for a company. Uh, and then compensation, that's a very important part of work life, you know, for the people that, you know, the main reason that they're they're working is to be compensated if an organization isn't compensating them properly they may decide to move on from that job um, so there's a couple of different types of ways that you know people get compensated um, comp different types of compensation system one is time-based compensation where an employee is compensated based off of the number of hours that they work during a, a certain pay period and the other is output based or incentive uh, compensation where the employee is receiving a compensation based off of whatever output 
of a product or an item that they're doing. So an example of this, if if you have two different workers, you know, you have worker A and you have worker B, and they both work eight hour an eight hour shift together. For a time base, if worker A has an output of a thousand pieces and worker B has a output of 800 pieces those two are gonna still get paid about the same amount of money based off of the time based compensation when you use the output base compensation if worker A has an output of a thousand pieces and worker B has a output of 800 pieces worker A will probably get paid more money because they had a higher they had like 200 more pieces produced than worker B. So those are the two types of compensation systems. All right, so as you can see, the there are a lot of advantages and a lot of different advantages or a lot of disadvantages uh, for the two types of compensation systems um, on the management side uh, an advantage would one of the advantages is stable labor costs so you know how much you're gonna have to pay your employees be, if they work you know whatever hours they're supposed to start what what they're scheduled to work it's easy to administer so you don't have to sit there and try to figure out, okay, this person worked this amount of hours, um, but they produced this amount of you know, output. I gotta pay them this. It's just pretty much, we know the hours you worked, we know what your pay rate is, we're gonna pay you based off of that. A disadvantage of that would be no incentive for the worker to increase their output. So if, an, if a worker knows that they're only gonna get paid X amount of dollars per hour, you know, unless they're they're trying to be noticed for a positive reason, there's really no incentive for them to increase their output. You know, they're going to make the same amount of money regardless of if, you know, they have an output of a thousand pieces or 500 pieces. They're going to get paid the same amount of money. Advantages for output base for employee, you know, it's pay related, so it's based off of the effort they put in. So if they if they're all about, you know, having the highest amount of output, then their pay is going to reflect whatever that effort they put into it. Um, a disadvantage for the employee is, you know, the pay fluctuates. If you know, if one day, you know, you're you're you know you're you're feeling good happy you know you don't you don't have a sore back you know and you have a good day of you know you produce 800 items you know you you can expect to make more money but if a day after you did 800 and you can only do 400 then you're not gonna make as much so your pay is gonna fluctuate based off of the output that you give The next factor is the methods analysis. Um, it's a technique used to analyze how a job gets done. It's like they're looking at the, the whole job, the job as a whole, the, the big picture of the job. So the need for this type of analysis, uh, there's a few different reasons as to why you want to use the method analysis uh, one is you know there may be some changes in tools or equipment uh, another would be changes in product design or introduction of new products um, or accidents or quality problems um, if you think about an assembly line where you know you have people lined up to if you think about maybe uh, automobile you know you have people in different sections as as the 
as the vehicle goes down the assembly line, a group is doing a certain job, you know, and if one one person decides to not screw in a bolt or put an item a certain place, you know, in the wrong place, that that's going to have a big effect on, you know, the quality that that comes out of that vehicle. So a team will begin with an overall analysis of a job. Then they move to specific details. Um, again, I went over the, the part of, you know, the assembly line where, you know, it's based off of, you know, if this person does their job, that person does their job, you're going to have a better item at the end of the, once that whole vehicle is assembled. Um, so you you want to start looking at different types of bottlenecks uh, to see what could be cut out of the job to to make you know the vehicle, for example, uh, better and more quality. All right, so organ organizations may consider jobs that have a high labor content uh, when selecting a different type, you know, a study that they want to use. Uh, so it's very easy to improve a job that that is highly automated, but when when there's actual laborers, um, you'll have a different degree of worker productivity. Um, based off of the different skill levels, you know, how that person or that laborer is feeling that day. And, you know, that may cause, you know, a loss of productivity depending on, you know, that laborer or that, that person that's working. It, you know, it, it may cause a different type of productivity or, you know, lower productivity depending on how that person's feeling. Um, they consider um, jobs that are done frequently. So they look at tasks that are done more frequently because they usually have a big impact on productivity and quality. Um, tasks that are unsafe, unpleasant, or or no un, or noisy. You know, it's just different things that you know that they consider when they look when they look to do some type of job study, um, just to make sure that you know the job that people are doing is you know something that's giving them that's adding value and that's making a the product more have have more quality to it so to analyze any job there's a standard method um, in doing it and one of the methods is using a flow chart which you you'll probably need to pay attention to this um, because you're gonna have to do it on, on your current event assignment. So if you look, you have an operation, some type of movement, someone's inspecting something, a delay, storage. And these are all, you know, they all have their little symbol. So operation, the circle is the symbol for the operation. That arrow is the symbol for movement. Square is the symbol for inspection. Delay is the letter D. And storage is the upside down triangle. Um, to develop this type of flow chart, you need to list all of the tasks involved and identify if it's an operation, if it's a movement, is it a delay, or if it's a storage. The ideal behind doing one of these flow charts is to identify what's the non-value added tasks that are involved. It's usually tasks that <clears throat> where there's there's nothing happening where you know the product is sitting idle. So any movements where where there's no movement, there's no value being added um, because time is money so every minute that an item isn't moving towards the final 
product that's a non-value added so that's why you want to do a flow process chart that's the whole reason behind it is to find out what the non-value added tasks are so that you can figure out if you can minimize that time that you know a item is in that that task or in that that stage another tool that's used is the the worker machine chart um, you have customer which is the worker on one side and then you have the machine on the other side so as you can see it says customer here you have your time which is in seconds and then you have your machine and then you have your individual steps now down at the bottom there's a summary and I, I want to let you know that for your current event assignment you will have to do a summary chart so just pay attention to to this slide to kind of get an idea of what to put on the summary uh, for the for the flow process chart so again you have your worker on this side and you have the different steps that the worker does and you see in the, the blue shade that shows you the time that the worker is 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 working on a, a certain item on the other side you have your machine and that's you know it could be a different color if you want it um, but for this flow chart or for this worker machine chart it's in green so this is where the machine is actually working so anywhere that it's blank that means that that person or that machine is idle so right here at like right around step three you see that the person's idle but the machine is running you know steps zero through two the machine is idle and then you go from four to five or four to seven or sorry I'm looking at the wrong steps. so one to two the steps the workers working machines idle three the workers not doing anything them they're idle the machine is working and then steps four to five that's where the worker is working again the machine is idle so based off of this you you can see that the machine is idle at a certain time so if it's idle at a certain time you might want to put something in there to to make it you know run and add value to something else Another way that or, uh, that or, what organizations use is the motion study. Um, this is a systematic study of the human motions used to perform an operation. So some of the techniques that are used is uh, the motion study principle, which it, it's mostly based off of Gilbreth's work. Um, you you can read in the book about Gilbreth, um, but it's. It's an analysis of, it's called the third, third bligs. It's actually, this word is, is Gilbert's spelled backwards. So um, an example of that would be like a copy machine when you do an example of third bligs. Um, a person may place the paper in the bin. They'll press a button. Um, the copy prints out so each step has a basic elemental motion and it's broken down the next technique is called micro motion study um, where they use motion pictures and slow motion to study motion so this is that's used a lot for like athletes where they're trying to you know speed up like if you're a runner you know you might you know time you know record yourself while you're running so you can see if you're not coming off you know if you're coming off real slow at the, the start start you you can look and see what you can look at ways to you know make yourself quicker at coming off that start after using you know the techniques that were discussed for the the motion motion study techniques um, organization will develop work methods to get an idea of what's 
the non-value added activities and they'll attempt to eliminate unnecessary motions um, they may may decide to combine activities they may want to reduce fatigue um, this can be this can have a big impact fatigue can have a big impact on productivity and quality because if if a person a person is fatigued or you know slouchy because you know they're idle for so so long that's going to have a big impact on productivity um, analysis also attempt to improve the arrangement of the workplace if the workplace is cluttered you know you might not be able to find the piece or the tool that you need real quick so that you can you know fix a problem or to work on the problem if it's you know if it's organized and everything is where it should be you can quickly find whatever you're looking for and start working instead of you know looking around for for a certain item so that you can finish your job again time is money so if you're wasting time looking for something to complete uh, a product or complete a job you're wasting time So work measurement is concerned with how long it should take to complete a job. It doesn't, it's not concerned with, you know, the job content or how the job is being completed. It's just worried about how long it's going to take to complete the job. To make improvements, organizations should be able to measure how long it should take to do a job. For every activity, there's going to be an ideal set, an ideal time that's set um, and that a job should be completed. So there's four commonly used work measurement techniques. Um, you have your stopwatch time study, which is used to develop stand a standard base based on observations of of an of one worker and how long it takes them to complete something and then you have <clears throat> you have your standard elemental times or historical times as it's, it's, it's it appears here your predetermined time standards and your work sampling As far as the stopwatch time study, that's used again to develop a standard based on observations. Um, there's four basic steps when trying to do a, a stopwatch time study. Uh, first step is to, divide, to, to define the task to be studied and to inform you know, the people that, that you're going to be monitoring. You need to tell them that they're going to be studied. Um, second step is to determine the number of cycles to observe. So in statistics, anything over 30 samples is a large sample. So large samples are very helpful when you're trying to figure out the different variations. The third step is the time. Um, you, you need to time the job and rate the worker's performance. And then the fourth step is to compute the standard time. As far as the historical time study or the standard elemental time, that's a time derived from a company's own historical time study. So there's four steps to, to coming up with the standard or the historical time. First, you need to analyze the job. Second thing you need to do is check check files for historical so if it's available you want to check historical times and then the third step is to modify the times if necessary so this can be done if there are errors found in in the the study or in, in the the data that you receive and then the fourth step is to add up all of the elemental times to get a normal time predetermined time standards um, that involves the use of published data on standard elemental times um, some advantages to doing the predetermined data time standard include 
It's based on a large number of workers under control under control conditions, which makes it more representative of what an employee is going to experience throughout their work shift or throughout the time that they're working on a certain item or product. Uh, the second advantage is the an the analyst is not required to rate the performance. If they were required to rate the performance, this may make the study more subjective. So <clears throat> if the analyst, um, you know, decides that, you know, they don't, they want to keep something out of the study, well, they can keep it out and that kind of messes up the data that's being collected. The third advantage is there's no disruption of operation because the data is already collected. So you don't need to go to any sites, any different site, work sites, or, or do anything like that. You already have the data collected. That's all you need to do is come up with uh, some, some values from what you have. And then the standards um, have already been established. So you know how long it's supposed to take to do a certain job. That's already spelled out for you. And then as far as work sampling, this involves making a brief observation of a worker or machine at random intervals. So work sampling really doesn't require any type of timing, you know, time in an activity or involve constant observation of activity. You know, the analysts just come to observe. Um, they don't have to take, they don't have to bring any, you know, anything to write with. They just come out and observe at different times of a work shift. Um, they're not collecting any data. So again, you don't need to, you don't need to carry anything with you. You're just coming out to observe what's going on. Um, and the, one of the reasons why is you don't want to impact the worker's performance. If a worker see, knows that they're being you know, watched or being, you know, observed, they may, you know, change up their, their working habits. So you want to just be able to observe and not, not have, you know, the worker know that you're observing them. All right. Remember that. All right, so basically, um, to, to break it down for operations management, um, it's important to make a design of work systems um, because you, in, the, in the end, you know, people are still the heart of the business. You may have, you know, some things may be automated um, with machinery, but the people are still in, an important part of how most business is conducted. Workers can be valuable sources of insight and creativity. So, you know, if workers know that a certain thing isn't working properly, you know, they can give insight, they can provide insight to their supervisors or managers to let them know, hey, we may want to cut this stuff out because it's, it's causing a, a big bottleneck, you know. So workers can give you valuable insight. Uh, it can be beneficial to focus on quality of work life and instilling pride and re respect among workers. This goes into the morale of the employee. You know, if an employee feels respected and they feel like they're part of a team, and if you base your design based off of that, you know, you'll have a, a, a more productive um, and possibly safety conscious worker. And companies are reaping gains through worker empowerment. So the more that companies give empower their employees, the more the company is reaping the benefits. Um, if an employee feels like they're part of a solution and not causing the problem, they may be more. Um, they may have more pride in their job and have a better feeling about the company. So. Just keeping all in mind as far as the, the operation strategy that, you know, people are important 
and there are they are an important aspect of business and that you know coming up with different types of work designs and measurements and, and using measurements to see you know what's what's really happening it's really important you know that that happens all right so that was the last slide we'll go over what's going to be on the quiz all right so if you if you're ready all right so for the quiz that's coming up you need to uh, the key terms ergonomics flow process chart job design job rotation motion study OSHA predetermined time standards self-directed teams specialization third blicks and work measurement those are the key terms that you need to know for the quiz as far as discussion and review questions number two number four number five and number seven 